All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today's webinar. Uh, my name is Mackenzie Pope. I am the Director of Development at the Waterfront Alliance. I'm honored to be here with you all and as well as our panelists. Um, and I'll kick us off with a brief introduction just to set the stage um, before handing it over to the panelists. So uh, Waterfront Alliance is a US-based nonprofit organization with a growing alliance of more than 1,100 partners that collectively focus on environmental and economic development and bringing about real change to shorelines, waterfronts, coastlines across the nation, as well as the New York, New Jersey region. So this year, Waterfront Alliance launched a new monthly webinar series that is focused on building a space for critical conversations around key climate related issues facing our region. So we are thrilled you could join us today for our third webinar in the series. And I welcome you to visit our website to learn more about upcoming webinars in the series as well. And I believe a colleague will be dropping that link in the chat as well. So today's webinar is titled a mid-year review of Waterfront Alliance's policy platform. Our panelists today will discuss the challenges that the climate crisis is bringing to our waterfronts and our communities. And uh, the 2024 Waterfront and Resilience Platform captures Waterfront Alliance's uh, approach to addressing these challenges through smart, just, and actionable solutions. And importantly, we cannot tackle these issues alone. So many, many of our partners and organizations across the region are working collaboratively to ensure that we advance a set of solutions for a more resilient, accessible, and prepared New York and New Jersey region, which is why we're here today. So it's my honor to introduce you to our panelists. Uh, we're joined by Emily Fano, Director of Climate Resilience Education at the National Wildlife Federation. Emily holds a master's degree in urban environmental policy from Tufts University and is an experienced climate leader specializing in the design, development, implementation, and management of urban climate resilience education programs. She manages the Resilient Schools and Communities Program for the National Wildlife Federation and co-founded the Climate and Resilience Education Task Force. We are also joined by Shay Thorvaldson, founder, principal, and CEO of TMS Waterfront. Shay is off screen today, but with us um, uh, on the phone. So Shay uh, has more than 20 years of marine site, civil and geotechnical engineering for waterfront structures. His diverse background includes the management of numerous waterfront project components involving resident engineering inspections, design build, permitting, cost management, among many and many others. Uh, Tyler Taba, uh, Director of Resilience at Waterfront Alliance. Tyler joined Waterfront Alliance in 2022 as the Senior Manager for Climate Policy and was quickly promoted to Director of Resilience. He is charged with developing climate change policy and strategy, leading the coordination and convening of the Rise to Resilience Coalition and identifying changes and trends in climate change that affect uh, and dictate new strategy. And lastly, we are joined by Joseph Sakawi, Waterfront Alliance's Chief Waterfront Design Officer. Joseph leads, leads the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines Program, known as WEDGE, and oversees Waterfront Alliance's resilience planning project in Flushing Meadows Corona Park. He brings significant experience in ports, offshore wind, climate resilience planning, and economic development policy and infrastructure. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, so I will, I'll get us started with a first question just to sort of set the stage and give us an um, overview of what, what we're going to be talking about. So Tyler and Joseph, if you could start us off, um, can you just tell us a bit about Waterfront Alliance's first formal policy platform? Um, what's included in it and, and what was the motivation for putting it together? Yeah, thanks, Mackenzie. Uh, Joseph, I'm happy to start and then maybe pass it, pass it to you. Um, so hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Like Mackenzie said, my name is Tyler. I'm the Director of Resilience at Waterfront Alliance, and I help lead our policy and advocacy work around climate resilience and adaptation. Um, and so I'm really excited to be here to talk about the policy platform. Uh, for folks who haven't seen it, this is what we're calling our first formal policy platform. Um, Waterfront Alliance, like Mackenzie said, has been around for 17 years, and we've been doing policy and we've been doing advocacy work um, so it's not our first policy priorities, but it's really the first time that we're taking a look at the broad program areas that we have within our organization and putting together what the priorities are and how they're kind of connected and, and working together. And so 
for folks who know uh, our organization, you know that we do a lot of work around climate resilience, planning, and infrastructure. We also do work on emergency preparedness, youth-based education, um, maritime and working waterfronts, offshore wind. And so how does all of that kind of fit into one greater vision? And that was really the goal of putting together the waterfront um, platform, the policy priorities platform that we're talking about here today. And so, um, you know, the, the premise for the platform really is that there's not a shortage of challenges across our waterfronts and our shorelines. And so we are putting together a roadmap, I think, for Waterfront Alliance's comprehensive approach to addressing all of these challenges through um, actionable, smart, and equitable and just uh, solutions, policy solutions. And so if you take a look at the platform, which I know we're going to put a link to in the in the chat, <clears throat> you'll see that it kind of spans across a few program areas that that we work on as an organization. And there's five kind of core program areas within the policy platform. And so I'll just do a quick overview of what those are just for folks who maybe aren't familiar. And then I think we're going to spend the rest of the time actually going into the detail of some of those um, some of those themes and categories. So the first one is climate change, resilience, and adaptation. And that is um, the longest section of the policy platform. It actually includes five um, subcategories. Those subcategories are infrastructure and design, governance and planning, funding and investments, um, emergency preparedness, and designing the best waterfronts possible, which is really our focus on our waterfront edge design guidelines or wedge program that Joseph is gonna talk about in a bit. So this section really spans across the whole comprehensive list of policy solutions for climate resilience um, and adaptation. And if you've ever been on a Waterfront Alliance webinar or event before, I'm sure you've heard us say this, that there is no single solution. And so none of the categories or none of the policy priorities in those in this section really work together or work um, alone. They have to be working together. And so the reason that this section is kind of long and has these five subcategories is because we're connecting all these pieces of infrastructure and governance and funding and design all together to really make the case for, for a climate resilient future. The second section is climate and estuary education. And so this is really focusing on making sure that young people are at the forefront and part of the solutions to the climate crisis. We have a youth-based um, climate education program called Estuary Explorers, where we actually work with young people in schools and, and teach climate change curriculum and take students out to the waterfront, do field labs. It's a really exciting program. And it's really important, I think, that we are teaching youth the basics of climate change and what the solutions are. And so we're, I mean, obviously very, very excited to have Emily here to, to talk about her perspectives and her leadership in that in that area. The third category in the policy platform is public access to the waterfront. And this is one of Waterfront Alliance's longest standing program areas. Um, this is the work that we've been leading to ensure that our waterfront communities and neighborhoods have access to these special waterfront places in their neighborhoods, which are often actually cut off or industrial or derelict and just kind of remain sitting there. We're really thinking about how can we turn these places into beautiful places that in many communities, particularly in communities of color and low income communities, there is limited access. How can we start to activate these sites, bring them to life, whether that's kayaking or walking and biking, get downs, beach access. It's obviously different in every neighborhood, but it's it's special in every neighborhood. And so the platform actually goes through and, and details two of our key um, priority sites for this year, which is one in the South Bronx, where we're working with a really wonderful community partner, South Bronx Unite. Um, and the second one is on the North Shore of Staten Island, where we're working with another wonderful community partner called Kayak Staten Island. So I'd encourage folks to check that out. The fourth section on the, in the policy platform is another one of Waterfront Alliance's longest standing program areas. That is the maritime working waterfronts and waterborne um, transportation section. And so here we're actually looking at policy solutions um, aimed at moving more goods by the water and reducing truck traffic on the roads. But we're also looking at solutions for the future of the maritime industry and what a green maritime industry might look like. So investing in electrification and cleaner vessels in the ports, that kind of that kind of stuff can be found in this section. And then waterborne transportation, which is also in this section, that's really about our work um, and advocacy around the New York City ferry um, and ferry service more broadly and expanding ferries into transit deserts or piloting electric ferries. And, you know, actually, interestingly and excitingly, I would say on September 10th, so not too far from today, there is a city council hearing on the New York City ferry. It's an oversight hearing on the New York City ferry. And so um, when I get finished with this section, I can actually pull it up and drop a link to the chat. If anybody 
rides the ferry, loves the ferry, I'd encourage you to testify or submit your written testimony in support of the New York City Ferry. And then the last section in the policy platform is called renewable energy. And this section is really looking at the offshore wind industry, which is coming into our region very quickly. We're really excited about that growth of clean energy in the region and also the important workforce development that comes with offshore wind. Um, and so you can find some of our goals there. Obviously, a lot of the siting for the projects that are happening in the region are going to be at the waterfront. So we want to make sure that those are resilient. And in this section, we also indicate Waterfront Alliance is signing on to the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, where we are calling to end fossil fuel exp exploration and expansion and to phase out existing production. And so I know that's a lot, but that's really kind of a high level overview of the sections within the platform. And, and we're really excited to be talking about kind of the progress on where some of these issues are at. But I'll, I'll, I'll sort of pause there and see, Joseph, if you have anything that you may want to add. I mean, that was pretty comprehensive. <laughs> and and the, the the policy world is is really your, your space within Waterfront Alliance. So I don't have a ton to add. Uh, but one thing that I'll share for kind of context for folks is that you know, while the policy platform is largely, not exclusively, but largely kind of legislative focused or funding focused, it's not the only ways that we at Waterfront Alliance are really working to influence government decision making. So if we broaden that definition of, of what is policy work, there's other aspects of our work that come into play. Um, so we're, we're working right now with New York City Parks in Flushing Meadows, Corona Park. Um, where, you know, this is one of the most frequently flooded parks in New York City. Waterfront Alliance looks at that and goes, this is a place that particularly with climate hazards evolving, this place really needs attention because it's a special place that's really at risk. So we're working with New York City Parks to get early designs of resilient solutions that are then meant to position the city to go out and get its own funding to actually build projects. So we're we're in a way helping helping define what are the actual priority areas that the city should have and pushing them to do more. Doing similar work in Coney Island Creek. This is an area that the city actually identified, hey, this is a, a priority for us. They put together this great resilience plan back in 2016, and it just kind of sat and got dusty. And we're, we're now working with the city. They thankfully have gotten some FEMA funding just this past spring, which is amazing. Um, we're now starting to work with with a couple different agencies along Coney that have land along Coney Island Creek um, on resilience and ecological restoration as a way to kind of advance the the city's priorities there more, and ensure that we're 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 protecting the, the communities there. And then another example I'll give um, one that um, is kind of evolving very rapidly. Um, it's Brooklyn Marine Terminal. So this is the, the port facility in Brooklyn. Uh, the only, uh, the, the, it's the only container facility um, in Brooklyn for those familiar. It's, it's where Red Hook Container Terminal sits, uh, along with a number of other operators are there. That facility is at risk of kind of caving to private sector real estate development, uh, but it's critical cargo and freight infrastructure for the city we are, are being very active in ensuring that that stays a working waterfront facility. Um, there's ways that we can enhance public access there. There's ways that it, it, it definitely needs to be modernized. Um, but we're helping to make sure that the city recognizes the need that that remain um, working waterfront operations there. So there's some of the other kind of non-legislative ways that we're helping shape um, policy and decision making across across New York. Similar stories we could tell in 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 New Jersey um, as well. Great, great. Thank you, Joseph, for that additional context, and and Tyler for the for the overview of the policy platform. Um, so uh, before going into the next question, I see we do have a question in the chat. So there is there's no presentation. So um, we'll just, it'll just be dialogue based, um, and then. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. So if you do, if anyone else has additional questions, definitely feel free to drop those in the chat or the Q&A portion, and we'll save time at the end to address all of those. Um, so these next set of questions I'll go through sort of address each section of the policy platform. So so we'll first turn to climate education. I'm mean, sorry. First, we'll turn to the climate resilience priorities, um, and, and we'll stay with Tyler on this question. So 
Tyler, can you discuss um, some of the key climate change and resilience priorities that Waterfront Alliance has focused on this year? Um, and maybe provide some context on, you know, why why these priorities and uh, what are they looking to address? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, and and to answer the question and or to respond to the question in the chat, yes, I didn't mean to sound like I'm moving through a slideshow, but I was going through the platform, which is kind of set up in that way. So the, maybe the best way without a slideshow is to have maybe the policy platform also open, and then you can kind of track where we're where we're going through with with all of this. But I don't know if that's a compliment or, or a negative thing, but we'll just we'll just roll with it. So um, yes, so on the climate resilience and adaptation piece here, I. Um, I, I, there's a lot. And so I kind of want to focus on a couple things maybe that have happened on the legislative side. So Joseph kind of painted a good picture about some of the other issues that are non-legislative, but maybe I'll focus here on the legislative side of things since that's kind of my area of expertise. And, and I'm happy to start off with what's been happening in the early part of the year, which was a lot of focus within the New York state, um, legislative session up in, up in Albany. And so some of the key climate resilience and adaptation priorities that we were advocating for at the state level were really around governance and planning. And one of them is a bill called the Climate Resilient New York Act. And this is actually the first year that the bill has been introduced. Um, it's a brand new bill. It's it's um, sponsored by the chair of the environmental committee in the in the New York State Senate. So it's really backed by an environmental champion, which is which is really positive. And the law would essentially require that New York create an office of resilience that manages and oversees all of the state's climate resilience priorities. Um, so right now, for context, a lot of the resiliency priorities within the state are happening in various agencies or, or in almost in all agencies, right? Like par the Parks Department has some resiliency work in their portfolio. The Homes and Community Renewal has some resiliency in their portfolio. The Department of Environmental Conservation, of course, has a lot of resiliency in their portfolio. But are these agencies working together? And so this law would essentially create an office that is in charge of overseeing the state's general resiliency priorities and would actually appoint a chief resilience officer, the state's first chief resilience officer, to really be at the helm of all of that work. And it's really modeled after um, successful legislation in, in many other states across the country. And so we saw good progress on that bill, although it didn't pass. We picked up some good co-sponsorship along, in, in, um, along the state Senate. And because it was the first year, I think it was really focused on educating the legislator about why this is important and why we need to do this. And, and I think we're feeling pretty optimistic going into the next legislative session that we can make some good um, progress on that bill and hopefully have it pass. And, and I'll, I'll also just add a note that in, in January, Governor Hochul in her state of the state did commit to a statewide resilience plan. So this is something that the state has actually said forwardly that they, they need and so this is a bill that would actually make that happen. Um, another example is a bill called the Rain Ready New York Act, which is um, another kind of governance, but also a little bit of a funding bill. And this one would clarify some legal authority around um, local water and sewer authorities. So you can think about those are those are in entities like New York City DEP, um, Albany Department of Water, the Buffalo Sewer Authority. There's, there's several across the state, and these are kind of authorities that manage um, wastewater and sewage and, and also stormwater. And this bill would clarify the legal authority for those agencies to manage stormwater and sewage water together and to be able to actually restructure rates in a way that it makes sense for the kind of growing flood risks that we're seeing across the state. So really the rain-based flood risks that we're seeing and what kind of infrastructure solutions can come out of that across the state. So this one did pass unanimously in the state Senate, which is really, really positive. Um, it kind of stalled in the assembly. And so we're going to have to go back in the next legislative session and move it forward. And and just for anybody who's kind of following New York state legislative policy, uh, the assembly is, was actually kind of the, the big holdup on a lot of climate legislation. And so we're, we're really going to have a lot of work to do with trying to move that move that forward and change direction. And now we're kind of shifting into New York City's legislative session. And so we're thinking about some of the ideas that are in our policy platform around what New York City should be doing. And a couple of those things include, one is the, the codification of a new Bureau of Coastal Resilience within the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, so there's now a new office called the Bureau of Coastal Resilience within New York City DEP. We have a deputy commissioner, Lorian Farrell, who's just fantastic. And, and we really want to see that office stay permanent within the city's structure. And that office right now is kind of tasked with overseeing the city's entire coastal resilience portfolio, which is massive. 
And so that office needs staffing, right? That office needs funding. And so we really want to see that become a permanent part of the city's um, structure moving forward. So that's something that we're exploring going into the session this year. Another, another really important one is around um, introducing legislation that would codify the city's efforts for creating a voluntary buyout program. So we're kind of looking at, at some legislative avenues at the city level too that we're really excited about. Great, thank you, Tyler. Um, and, and anyone can feel free to jump in to add anything at any point, but I, I do have one question that we can maybe turn to Joseph. So um, a key part of resilience will also involve access to waterfronts and e ecological protection of our waterfronts as well. So um, Joseph, can you tell us a little bit about the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, uh, the WEDGE program, and, and the role it can play in building connections to state and federal funding, um, as well as codifying some of these resilience priorities. Yes, yeah, so so WEDGE or Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, and I'll make sure to say that acronym a couple times, WEDGE, Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines. Um, that's, that's one of our most important tools for um, making resilience and environmental uh, protection and public access actually happen. Um, so for those uh, on the call who aren't familiar with WEDGE, you can think of WEDGE as being like lead standards, but for the waterfront, um, where it's a set of, of design guidelines and then very specific performance criteria, 143 different performance indicators in total, um, all focused on kind of how do we make the most out of this waterfront site? And kind of the fundamental question that WEDGE helps projects answer is if we're building on the waterfront, whether that's an offshore wind port facility, whether that's the, the river ring project from Two Trees Development on the East River, or whether that's a park or a resilience project, how do we get this right? Uh, the waterfront is kind of the, it's the flagship site in any community, whether it's you know New York City and we're talking Brooklyn Bridge Park, or we're talking about the tiny, the, the, the river and the tiny town of Michigan that I'm from. Um, the waterfront's the flagship site. Wedge is there to help you get it right. Um, we see wedge, you know, from a, a kind of the overlap with policy comes in a couple of ways. So there are places where, you know, we are directly codified in um, land use processes. Uh, is an example of that in New Rochelle, we're in the zoning code for multifamily developments along the waterfront. Um, we're in two different ordinances in the city of Miami, one focused on city stormwater capital projects, the other is part of their, the city's own design guidelines for the, the Baywalk and Riverwalk, which are right downtown. Um, we're in the, it's not exactly codification, but we're in the Sustainable Infrastructure Guidelines, which is Port Authority of New York and New Jersey's internal tool for um, project development. Um, so there's ways that just kind of off the shelf, and this is the, the wedge manual, off the shelf, the wedge manual can be built into policy. There's also ways you know, that, that different agencies use the use wedge on their own sites. So Parks has sites that are built to wedge standards. EDC has used it on projects. DDC, the Department of Design and Construction, uh, used it on East, uh, East Side Coastal Resilience. So these these big agencies, Hoboken's got one in the pipeline, Battery Park City Authority's got one in the pipeline, South Battery Park City Resilience uh, has earned wedge verification. That as the agencies are designing these sites, the design teams and the agencies have the manual next to them to see how are we actually aligning with these priorities around resilience, ecology, and access. And those are really the three big drivers of wedges, resilience, ecology, and access. There's other ways that we're plugging into to state and federal policy. So, you know, there, there's a, a lot of alignment um, with different state and federal grant opportunities uh, in New York and beyond. Um, so as an example of that, EDC just listed us in the hazard mitigation grant um, that they that they got for their Coney Island Creek work. Um, that grant application listed wedge, and that's a way that they're signaling to the agencies hey, we've, we're going above and beyond in these areas. We want to provide these broad community benefits. And they use WEDGE to show that. 
Um, offshore Wind is is doing that. We're we're in an RFP now for Offshore Wind with NYSERDA. Um, and then we're also looking at things like Community Rating System, which is FEMA's tool for determining um, the the cost of flood insurance for communities across the country. We're 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 right now working with FEMA on lining up wedge next to CRS and saying, if you have wedge policies in place, this is how it helps you in the CRS system. So there's all these different ways that kind of wedge overlaps in the, in the policy space. Joe, is it okay then Shay from TMS? Yeah, go ahead, Shay. So this wedge, thanks. So wedge and TMS and Indigo, we've been using wedge for since we started six years ago, the two companies, but we've been involved with Wedge and Waterfront Alliance um, for about 10 years now. And we do a lot of that from the private side and and development on the waterfront is one of those areas that becomes difficult when there's a lack of expertise. And what we find the Wedge policies when they started and when they are used properly and when they're used properly with engineers and architects that understand and work with the Alliance is it provides us a very good roadmap for planning on the waterfront as well. For private developers that might have never built a waterfront development, whether it be a working waterfront port or like for us, we're building a, we're, we're programming an offshore wind port in Staten Island uh, that made it through the city's Euler process last week. Um, and a big focus of educating that customer from Boston was how wedge could be applied to that not only to that site, but also to the mitigations and to the other things that are necessary that are part of a, a major development. But the one thing that has to go further, and I think talking about this a little further is the buy-in from the agencies, the New York City DEP, the New York State DEC, those agencies currently, and I think quite a few of the experts could probably confirm this, is they haven't quite bought into Wedge 100% yet as a regulatory tool that next step that Joe, uh, Joe referred to, getting it in New Rochelle, getting into Miami, getting it into the DEC's lexicon and being part of their permit review process for waterfront projects and waterfront development into the D DSBS and Department of Buildings code would help further codify that and also provide a much cleaner roadmap. So right now, AECOM and TMS and Indigo are, are and um, amongst other team members, MSI, are writing a new waterfront code for the city of New York. The, it'll be the first in the country and we believe the first in the world. Wedge actually is a big cornerstone to that codification because it gave an immediate outline for some of the things that are extremely important that aren't necessarily covered in Appendix G of the New York, the current New York City Building Code. And so there has been, Wedge and, and Joe's team have provided a leg up for the city already to do that. And that's really going to be the next push for everybody is really understand that and get everybody on board to that process. Because when the when the waterfront code is written, wedge is going to be a cornerstone to it, and we should be able to advance that throughout the city. Thank you, Shay. That actually is very, very helpful context. Um, sometimes the regulations can get a bit in the weeds, but it's helpful to hear from an actual practitioner's perspective. So thank you for that. Um, we could go on and on about, uh, about some of those priorities, but for the sake of time, I think we'll move on to the next section of the policy platform, which is uh, climate education. Um, and Emily, this would be really great for you to get, add in some context here. So um, I know, Emily, you're working closely on the climate education bill in New York State. I was wondering if you could describe the history of that bill a bit. Uh, what it includes and some of the challenges that you faced uh, with getting this bill moving. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, I'd first like to make a little bit of, of a plug for um, climate resilience education more generally. Um, I'm putting a link in for our Resilient Schools and Communities program, which launched in New York City schools in 2017. And the impetus for that was really um, because students are not learning about climate change um, at all in, in our schools. On average, they get about two hours per school year on climate um, if they're lucky uh, and usually if they take AP environmental science, but resilience 
is typically not covered. And so we've been um, for the last several years bringing students out to Coney Island Creek Park um, to teach them some basic um, terms, glossary terms, if you will, um, using field guides so that they can explore the park and learn about resiliency features, um, riprap, um, sea walls, um, nature-based features. And then we brought um, 22 schools out um, and about 600 folks and including community members to restore dunes out there. Um, and they've been growing really well over the last several years, but it really, um, we're trying to provide a coastal buffer um, for residents that are living along Bayview Avenue, um, right adjacent to the park because that area was flooded terribly um, during her Superstorm Sandy. Um, so that's just a, a little bit of an, um, you know, a, a view of the kind of resilience education that we're that we're that we're leading there, um, and the program's been adopted in different places, including Puerto Rico. Um, but you asked about the climate education bill, so we um, also wanted to put a link into um, our platform, um, the Climate and Resilience Education Task Force. First of all, is an intergenerational body of educators, um, policymakers, students. Um, NGOs. Um, we have a coalition of about 400 organizations now, including Waterfront Alliance. And we are, um, we launched in 2018 to address this lack of climate education um, and resilience education um, across our state. And um, really quickly learned that we needed a policy remedy for the fact that climate education and resilience education just don't appear um, in our standards in a robust way. And so we um, analyzed a number of different climate education bills that have been introduced uh, by a, a number of different legislators over the years, and we're not really thrilled with any of them. And so we decided to first um, create our own platform for climate education, which basically laid out the elements of what we, we felt were um, important for a successful statewide program. And that was really based on research of different programs across the state, across the country rather. Um, there's different initiatives in Washington state, New Jersey is obviously mandated climate education. It's the only state that has done that. Um, but Illinois just did actually. Um, and so we looked at best practices um, and uh, program elements in other states and laid out our vision, and that includes updated climate literacy standards, um, teacher professional development, both for pre-service and in-service teachers, um, an office of climate education for coordination, um, mental health support for students and educators, um, and a number of different things. And so we essentially decided that we would take the best climate education bill that we thought, um, you know, kind of aligned to, to our vision and proceeded last year to um, work with Senator Gunardis's office in Brooklyn um, and revised it. And we really threw everything in that we wanted. Um, and they accepted the bill pretty much with very few edits, except they took out a $20 million appropriation um, because they didn't think that it would pass with, with such an appropriation. So we um, basically submitted the bill was introduced last November. Um, we brought busloads of students to Albany several times um, this year. Uh, we got 70 organizational endorsements, you know, memos of support. Um, we got, um, you know, some really, we had 130 meetings with legislators. And for the first time, we got 42 assembly co-sponsors, 19 Senate co-sponsors, a lot of media attention. But the bill didn't pass. We also didn't get um, a penny from, you know, from the governor for for climate education. Um, but what's happening now, which is really promising, is we've been working with the state ed department for for several years to get them to collaborate with us on um, a legislative package um, that they feel comfortable with, and we're in the process of collaborating with them on an appropriation um, and language for an Article 7 um, bill that will be introduced in this next session. And so we're really hopeful that, um, you know, because state ed is at the table and they are requesting this appropriation um, for updated learning standards um, and a number of other things that 
this year we will actually see some movement um, in this space and we're really excited about that. Great, thank you for that overview. And I think you were, you're kind of touching on it. I have, I have a, a guess that it might be uh, what the ch biggest challenge might be, but um, it sounds like you're building a lot of support, which is great, but also potentially facing some challenges. Like you're saying funding might be a, a major issue. Are there any other big challenges that are preventing this bill from moving forward? Um, I, I wouldn't, I think there's just a lot of different players, um, you know, at the table. I think, um, you know, what we've been told is that the Office of the Budget is always a challenge because they tend to cut things a lot. Um, and the State Ed Department has been, you know, cut in general. They Their budgets have been cut over the years and they're really lacking staff to carry out basic activities, you know, even just basic, uh, you know, um, things for literacy, social studies, um, test development, th things like that. And so, you know, our request for for climate updated climate literacy standards kind of is in context of all the other needs that they desperately have um, as a state um, education agency. And so we need to work with them um, to make sure that whatever is proposed is doable, feasible for them, um, and um, palatable to, you know, the governor's staff, uh, the budget folks, you know, the um, legislators um, who may want a different version of a bill, you know, like there's just a lot of different players that we have to kind of work with. Um, the most important thing is getting something through this year because our kids can't wait for bureaucracy um to catch up to nature you know nature is not waiting for us to make up our minds and um move forward so we we just want to get something done for our students um two and a half million students including um you know those in in climate vulnerable communities that usually have much fewer resources than than others but the most important thing is getting um you know young folks, you know, educated about these topics because they are the ones that can support the kinds of policies that you all are advocating for. Without education, you know, we won't have uh, a climate literate citizenry that understands the importance of the policies that you all are putting forward. So the two go hand in hand. Absolutely. And we're, we're really happy to be a part of that advocacy strategy. And I know one of our webinars in, during New York City Climate Week will be focused specifically on climate education and some of, uh, some of the advocacy for that bill as well. So um, thank you, Emily. Uh, so the next, we'll move into the, the next uh, portion of the policy platform. So um, as an ally to the maritime industry, the, the blue tech sector, um, waterborne transportation and, and all associated industries, a Waterfront Alliance seeks to support the, the keystone role these sectors all play in the region's sustainability. So uh, we're particularly focused on green operations, um, including electrification and implementing or, and building related infrastructure that will support cleaner vessels, um, cleaner operations and, and healthier communities. Um, so I think Shay, this would be a good uh, a good one for you to to weigh in on. Sure. Uh, could you share your share some of your thoughts on the greening of the maritime sector? Sure. So we all know about the greening of the city. Um, everything on the waterfront seems to have been extremely valuable since the '60s. So we've got a lot of park and we've got a green space. The problem that we're going to have is that green space and those infrastructures. And the industries needed to support both resiliency and working waterfronts. If that if that infrastructure and that working waterfront disappears, the future of that waterfront, both for maintenance and resiliency, is in question. And so in addition to talking about green technologies, we have to talk about making sure that our waterfront infrastructure and our working waterfront is forefront. So what we're talking about and one of the major pushes for the last five years for myself, um, and it, it, it follows the push for the ferry system, is something that's very active in Europe. And that's the electrification of the maritime industry, the electrification of last mile shipping, 
um, and then providing the waterfront infrastructure and in what we call the blue highway or the maritime highway. Marit has a program across the United States that, um, that basically says, let's take trucks off the road, which will improve air quality um, and move goods off the roads, which will improve the quality of that infrastructure. But it's not without negatives. The challenges with moving freight off the roads onto the water is that the technology is still emerging. We're talking about electrification of vessels, which is still new in the United States. And it's much more advanced overseas. There is additional problems to that. Um, you know, the infrastructure to build the boats, to run the boats, and the manpower and the workforce to do that greening of that technology, whether it's the last mile bike, electric battery storage, you know, floating battery storage, or simply captains and engineers that can run electric vessels, there is a significant lack of that pipeline moving forward. Much like the, the discussion has been around NYSERDA and the workforce development for offshore wind, the greening of these other technologies also has to have policy focus and a collective policy focus to allow it to move forward. Right now, one of our biggest challenges in New York City and, and in the outskirts is that there's no one policy person or no one policy agency that is pushing all of those green technologies forward. So you've got private entities, you've got agencies, and you've got everything in between trying to do things on their own to try to advance it. We ourselves have tried to do pilots for electric boats and short sea shipping, blue highway shipping, but without a network and without a centralized process, it's become very difficult. You need you know, pathfinders that have the money, the wherewithal and the property in order to set that up. If you don't build it, they won't come. This is a true thing where if you build it, they will come. A perfect example of something that's not green technology but worked is the private uh, sector set up the East River Ferries, New York Waterway. Um, that laid the groundwork for Hornblower and EDC to come in and create what we now know as NYC Ferry. There was a public-private partnership that stemmed from a private start. And then when the city came in and developed a full policy and pushed it forward, that became a really big part. So our challenge here is collective moving forward. One of the things that we postulated, much like was talked about before, you know, a Office of Sustainability for the New York City or for the state, one thing of policy that was looked at here is, could we have an office of waterfront like it used to be in the 60s and before in the New York City to sort of coordinate all these efforts? Um, unfortunately, in order to move trucks off, we need the waterfront and the waterfront then needs wedge and those things. So the biggest challenge is, is getting people collectively and moving in the same direction, much like NYC Ferry did. Uh, and that should be our real focus for the next decade, I think. Thank you, Shay. That was really interesting. And um, if there, there's a lot to be said there. I think we could go into more detail. If anyone else has anything to add, um, you can jump in now. Um, but if not, I think we will move into the our, our final question, which just to make sure we save enough time for, for Q&A. Um, so, all right. So for, for the entire group, um, I just wanted each of you to kind of speak to why why would you see it as critical that all of these different sectors you know maritime industry and climate education why that might on their face seem different and separate but why is it important that these um, priorities are are working together and also why are they seen as urgent um i guess tyler yeah if you want to get us started that would be great. yeah I'll, I'll i'll be brief so i can let others also chime in before we run out of time for the q and A, I I mean, I think one thing that I maybe didn't emphasize at the beginning when I was going through the kind of high level of the, the categories within the policy priorities is, like you said, kind of all these different sectors. But if you read through the policy priorities, you'll also notice that a lot of the a lot of the issues that we're touching on are, are related to other issues around uh, what residents and communities are, are dealing with. So there's issues around housing and there's issues around transportation and there's issues around zoning and development. And Climate resilience, I think, for us at Waterford Alliance, at least, is what we really see as the as the through line for all of these issues. And we're always trying to make the case that all these issues that we're tackling as a society, we should be looking at through a climate lens and a climate resilience lens. And so 
I think if you, as you kind of look through the policy priorities, you'll see that there's issues around governance and there's issues around funding, but they're all they're all touching these different kind of areas across our city, state, and and country, frankly. And and climate is kind of a lens to look through all of it. And so I think that's what I'm really excited about and why I see this as being really important is again, because there's no way that one policy issue by itself addresses a larger problem that we're dealing with. It's really gonna take this systems change approach. And that means tying it into all these kind of different other areas and avenues that that we're seeing progress on. Like there's, you know, there's progress on housing in New York City, at least the city's trying to do that. How can we make sure that climate is a part of that? There's there's progress, maybe or maybe not, with transportation, and how can we make sure that that climate resilience is seen as part of that through the you know the taking trucks off the road and that kind of link. And so I think there's links to all of it, and that's really I think important for us as an organization is to continue pointing to all of those intersections between these issues and climate resilience. Yeah, I'll, I can jump in and just uh, reiterate that without education, um, you know, students aren't going to be learning about these issues. One of the things we did with our um, Resilient Schools and Communities program is, is connect students to the one NYC back then, our city strategic plan, and have them really dig into it and learn about the different um, sections of it and um, create projects around it. I think if you ask any student in New York if they know what the Climate Act is or what Plan NYC is and have they read it, they will inevitably say no. And so I think it's really important um, to connect students to policy issues in in um, in where they live. Um, I know that there's a, a, a teacher that you all have worked with, Robert Markuski, who um, works at the Harbor School in Governor's Island, and he's used your wedge guidelines. Um, he's had uh, his students participate in advocacy opportunities like testifying before the city council. And I can tell you, because we've heard this also from legislators, that when they hear from students, it's really illuminating for them. And it really, I think, motivates them to, to move on important issues um, when they hear from, from students articulating these important topics. And so knowledge really is power. And we have to educate our kids about these issues if we want you know, a better future because we need an educated um, populace to move these issues forward, um, including policy. So, I can I can jump in next, and, and you know, if the, the questions around you know multiple stakeholder groups and and the need for different disciplines to work together. You know, this is something that, and I'll I'll default to wedge because I'm I'm the wedge guy, so I will talk about wedge, but. Our very first category in the, or very first credit in the system is enlist a multidisciplinary project team, where we expect that you are bringing together a really diverse set of disciplines and fields on the site design. And if we think about any change along the waterfront, you know, a, a project's going to be required by law to have an engineer and an architect on it to sign off on the plans. But the landscape architect's going to think about the you know drainage on the site and and green infrastructure and and plantings that have an environmental focus and and then you'll also need the environmental engineers who are who are going to look at you know the environmental impact of the site and that all changes if it's a brownfield site if it's contaminated which let's face it most of our urban waterfront sites are so that's another group that you need to bring in and then you need to think about you know, how you're aligning with SBS requirements and state DEC requirements. So you need your permitting experts and your your planners for zoning and your your legal team. And then you got to think about you know the the engagement process and all these people are designing the site. They're not going to be the ones using the site. So you've got to bring in the communities to that and have people that know how to bring in the communities effectively. And then as we see across New York City and New Jersey, we've got a lot of waterfront infrastructure that's literally falling in the water right now. We've got to think about how do you maintain that over the long term? That's a different set of people with a different set of agencies that they're working for. Like, I could I could do this for another 10 minutes and you'd all be bored out of your minds, but there's there's no one group that has that knows everything that goes into 
anything that happens on the waterfront, you have all of these different perspectives that have to be at the table. And it's just that much more complicated than, than other types of sites. Great, and um, I see Emily, you, play, you put a really important note in the chat, so I'm gonna read that out loud. Uh, Education is critical to provide pathways to gr green careers and workforce development opportunities, which addresses um, a comment Shay made earlier. So thank you for adding that. Yeah, I, can I just add also that like if you look at the uh, list of approved career and technical education programs through the state ed department right now, there's absolutely no mention of climate or resilience and one mention of alternative energy in East Suffolk BOCES. But like our CTE programs need to be upgraded and modernized so that if a student is looking for like a way to make an impact on the climate crisis or get a job in, in these industries, they understand that the connection between a trade they might be choosing and, you know, that and decarbonization, for example, or electrification of our, you know, maritime infrastructure. Like there's just right now that is a, a real need. Um, so that's something that we're looking at. And this is Shay again. I would just add one last thing is that education, tagging that and tagging it again, but education up to the regulators, the developers, and to the po politicians in terms of what's feasible, what can be done, and what the communities need. Generally, when we're looking at DAC, EJ, and the coined just transition, those communities are well aware of what's worked and what's not worked in their communities for the benefit or detriment of their communities. And that does not necessarily translate in or hasn't in the past translated into policy, environmental reviews, or those things. So we're fighting against that on the waterfront every day trying to do the things that are going to support those communities, but we find that we get railroaded into regulatory boxes that don't help us get out of our own way with regards to supporting those communities. Great. Thank you for that um, addition. So I think um, we're a little bit behind, but we do have a, a good six minutes left for some Q&A. So um, we'll move into that portion now. And I do see a couple uh, questions that did come through the chat. And remember, a reminder just to put those questions, if you do have any, in the chat or Q&A. So, um, so first question, I think this is uh, for Emily and Tyler, but feel, others feel free to jump in. Um, so what is the role of coalitions in building stronger legislation? Um, and, and what are some of the challenges that you see maybe relating to some of coalition building? I mean, yeah, I can take really quickly. I mean, coalitions are critical, um, diverse, um, you know, uh, coalitions. Um, we have tried to build a coalition, you know, um, for the climate education bill, and it definitely is helpful when you can show, uh, you know, legislators that you have a, a strong um, coalition behind you. And um, I would just say, um, yeah, it's essential. I think, you know, so many organizations have their own priorities and agendas. We've been working really hard to kind of educate uh, big green groups that education should be, you know, part of their platforms. And we're really excited that several, including Waterfront Alliance, of course, you already, you guys were already on board, but, um, you know, have included education in their policy agendas. And that's kind of like a goal um, of ours is to keep growing that. But I'd say unions are super important to any coalition. Um, you know, we've had faith-based groups. Um, so really important to create diverse coalitions. Um, and um, yeah, critical to the success of any legislative effort. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. I mean, we what we do convene a coalition called Rise to Resilience, and I know we didn't have a lot of time to talk about it here in this meeting, but, but folks are probably aware or have heard of the coalition, and it's exactly what Emily's saying. We try to bring together this kind of multi-sector, diverse group of organizations that are not always just environmental people either, right? It's, it's like you said, labor. It's people who are working in housing and transportation. It's people who are in academia local community-based organizations that have a whole host of issues that they're dealing with and making the case again that, that in our case for the Rise to Resilience Coalition, we're really looking at making climate resiliency an urgent policy priority. And so some of those efforts that I talked about earlier, that's kind of all, a lot of that at least is being pushed forward by a broader coalition. And it's really effective when you're dealing with 
policymakers and elected officials is to see a 30 or 40 or 50 organizations signed on to a letter versus one. And so no matter how powerful or big your organization's name is, having multiple different kinds of organizations and people behind your effort always makes the case that it's important. And so I'd say the role of coalitions is really, really important. And I think we're lucky to have convened this great coalition of Rise to Resilience. And um, and and yeah, so just echoing what, what Emily suggested. Yeah. And I would just also make a plug for intergenerational coalition building because uh, we've it's students have been at the forefront of all of our, um, you know, lobbying efforts and they've been critical. So um, youth groups are like really important to us and we always include them um, in, in our work. Great, thank you. Um, so I see one question in the Q&A from Paola. Uh, how can we access this guide? And it's in reference to the WEDGE manual. So Joseph, I'll let you take this. Um, so second part of the question is, is there a training offered to certify for WEDGE specialization? Yes, uh, so there's links to both of these in the chat. Uh, the, if you click on the link that says resources, you can download the WEDGE manual. Uh, that's got the design strategies and the performance indicators in it. We also offer the Wedge Professionals course. Uh, we, we There's two ways you can take that. In January and July, we, we run a live online version. Um, and then at wedgeprofessionals.org, uh, which I'll add to the chat in just a second, at wedgeprofessionals.org, there's an on-demand version. Um, you can take it anytime. Sign up, and meet, sign up at 101 p.m. immediately after this call. Great, thanks, Joseph. Um, okay, so the another question we received is is really important. So, so how do these policies that have been discussed uh, speak or relate to environmental justice and workforce development? Um, we touched on this a little bit, but I think it's worth diving into a little deeper. And that's for any panelist. This is Shay. I'll, I'll take it because we're deep into the. with the state mandates that developers who are looking to develop on the waterfront um, address, you know, key components of environmental justice and uh, along with Indigo is currently running a program through the EDC that is educating minority and disadvantaged community businesses on the waterfront and, uh, you know, offshore wind and stuff teaching them the basics and how to get their communities uh, involved in this stuff. With regards to the working waterfront, it is the number one source of workforce in all of the city to where these communities that are majority located on the waterfront, Red Hook, Sunset Park, um, you know, we can keep going even further. How to get them either into the unions because all of these offshore wind and all of the major constructions in New York City that are driven by CLCPA are going to be PLA based. So if they're not in the unions or if they don't have a pathway to the unions or a pathway to the job, it's very difficult to develop those workforces out of those small or those communities simply because it, it's the pathway is not there. And so creation of those pathways and it was already mentioned, the buy-in by the unions and the coalitions, the relaxation of PLAs, those workforce things, such as the concessions were made for South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, for the offshore wind hub for Equinor and South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, and others have to be able to bring that into their policy and mandate it, either codify it or whatever, in order to give those pathways. Because short of that, you know, teaching these individuals or businesses to be able to do it on their own is a limited, somewhat limited effectiveness, um, simply because they don't have the, the opportunities. And I think with Works Waterfront, if we don't change that workforce to the areas where these folks live in the communities, then we're going to be short of workforce indefinitely. Thank you, Shay, for that. And there is a lot, a lot more to say on you know, how this all relates to environmental justice and workforce development, but we are at time. So um, I think that, that is all we'll be able to discuss today. Um, but I just wanted to say again, thank you to our panelists for your time and expertise today. 
Uh, thank you for all the participants who took a, an hour out of your day. We really, really appreciate it and hope you hope you learned a little bit about some of the work uh, around climate resilience happening in New York um, and the region. And uh, please take a look at all of our next uh, upcoming webinars as well. There's uh, more to come this year and uh, we'll be circulating recording as well of this, of this webinar. So um, with that, uh, thank you everybody and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Mackenzie.